You know what's worse than being Neo stuck in the Matrix with a horrific monster? When you know that you're Neo stuck in the Matrix with a horrific monster. Well, today was escape day. Today was the day we met Morpheus. And her name was Judge Annalisa Nadine Torres. Ready? Let's go. I shouldn't be here right now. I myself should be deep in the matrix, tending to the fiat mines. But today is one of the most important days in the history of crypto. We're only going to talk about one thing, and you already know what it is. If you have a sneaking suspicion that this particular monster's name starts with a couple of G's and ends with Ari Ensler, or if you're finding value in this video, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. I know I said the next video was probably going to be in the new format, but this was just too important. Because I think this really was one of the most important days in the history of crypto, maybe one of the most pivotal days. And today, Judge Torres was a hero. You've got to understand, there's this perception that judges are some kind of like scientists, and it's like this very objective scientific process of interpreting statutes and precedent case law and coming to this conclusion and this interpretation of the law there's this perception and i think we're all glad that this perception exists that this is a very scientific and objective process and to some extent that's true however <laughs> what also often happens is that a judge will look at the whole picture they look at and understand how this case they're deciding will fit into the way we govern society. They understand that policy will be set in their decisions and it will have an impact on the way society runs. And so what also happens to some degree is that judges will decide which direction they want that policy to go. And they will come up with a seemingly very scientific way to craft their interpretation of the presidential case law and whatever statutes and regulations and academic literature, whatever goes into their decision, to some extent, they sort of decide what direction this policy should go in and they craft their decision, their interpretation of all this precedent to go in that direction. Judge Torres, like I said, is a hero because the policy impact of her decision is so pro-crypto. It's so good, and it's good in all the right ways. It's not just a, hey, let me give crypto everything crypto would want kind of thing. She gave us what we needed and what was probably right. Let me explain. We're going to go through this decision. I'm just going to hit the high points, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to keep this comprehensible for everybody. So there are going to be a lot of places where I'm going to simplify things, sometimes too much, but this is how we're doing it. So she starts out, for the reasons stated below, the SEC's motion is granted in part and denied in part, and defendant's motion is granted in part and denied in part. So what does this mean? We've got cross motions for summary judgment. Both the SEC and Ripple are asking for summary judgment. And here's how summary judgment works. Summary judgment is appropriate where the record shows that there is no genuine dispute as to any material fact and that the moving party is entitled to judgment as a matter of law. So the parties are basically saying to the court, hey, let's just, let's just look at the facts that everybody agrees on. Let's say if just those facts are true, and we're not even going to consider any other facts, just the facts that are not in dispute, the ones that everybody agrees are true. Let's just look at those facts. Let's take those facts and just apply the law to those facts and tell us if we just win based on that alone. That's what's happening with a motion for summary judgment. In this case, both the SEC and Ripple are asking for summary judgment. So of course, what we're dealing with here is the Securities Act. 
Section 5 of the Securities Act, which is about it being unlawful for any person, directly or indirectly, to offer to sell, offer to buy, or purchase, or sell a security unless a registration statement is in effect or has been filed with the SEC as to the offer and sell of such security to the public. And obviously, all the action here happens in the Howey test. If you've ever watched this channel, you've probably heard me talk about the Howey test before. We've gone into great detail about the three prongs as described in this case, or four prongs as, as they're described in another case. The only difference here is that they're going to, they're going to combine prongs three and four in this particular decision. But you've heard me talk about the Howey test many times. We're not going to go through it in a lot of detail here because I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to assume you're sick of hearing about the Howey test, at least what the prongs are. We'll just go through it real quick and then we'll see how the court here wants to apply it. So the court here says, in Howey, an investment contract is a contract transaction or scheme whereby a person, prong one, invests his money, prong two, in a common enterprise, and three, is led to expect profits solely from the efforts of the promoter or a third party. So that's the combined prong three and four that you might have seen in other cases. So Ripple says, oh, actually, what you should do is this thing, this essential ingredients test. The court says defendants advance a novel essential ingredients test. This is sometimes bad. When the court mentions that your legal theory is novel, what they're saying is you're the only one who thinks this. <laughs> and this is actually the case here. So this novel essential ingredients test is that there should be a contract between a promoter and an investor that establishes the investor's rights as to an investment, which contract imposes post-sell obligations on the promoter to take specific actions for the investor's benefit, and three, grants the investor a right to share in profits from the promoter's efforts to generate a return on the use of investor's funds. The court says the problem with this and the reason they're declining to adopt this novel essential ingredients test that Ripple is calling for is that... Ripple cannot cite a single case that has ever applied this test. So they go into a lot of detail here. We're not going to do that right now. You can go back and read all the detail around that if you want. So now the court's going to actually apply the test that they think is important. This is their interpretation of the Howey test. They say, the plain words of Howey make clear that an investment contract for purposes of the Securities Act means a contract transaction or scheme but, and this is important, the subject of a contract transaction or scheme is not necessarily a security on its face. The court analyzes the economic reality and totality of circumstances surrounding the offers and sells the underlying assets. So what are they saying? They're saying <clears throat> you could have an investment contract that qualifies as a security under the Howey test, but that doesn't mean that the underlying asset that the investment contract concerns is necessarily a security. So you could have an investment contract where XRP, the XRP token is the underlying asset. That could be a security. It could be an investment contract that qualifies as a security while XRP, the underlying asset might not be a security. So that's an important thing to keep in mind because that's, they're going to find exactly that in this case. Here, defendants argue that XRP does not have the character in commerce of a security and is akin to other ordinary assets like gold, silver, and sugar. And here again, they're going to dismiss Ripple's argument. This argument misses the point because ordinary assets like gold, silver, and sugar may be sold as investment contracts depending on the circumstances of those sales. This was predictable to me that the court would, would could very possibly come out in this direction because we know that you can have investment contracts that concern gold, silver, sugar, anything. I mean, the original Howey test was about an orange grove. So this was kind of predictable to, I think to a lot of people. So now we get down to, now that we've established that the underlying asset and the possible investment contract can be two different things as concerns whether or not they are security. We get down to the actual offers and sales of XRP. So, the SEC alleges basically four different types of sales. Three of them are by XRP. The fourth is by Larson and Chris Larson and uh, Brad Garlinghouse. So we've got institutional sales under written contracts for which X, uh, Ripple 
received $728 million. We've got programmatic sales on digital asset exchanges for which it received $757 million. And we've got other distributions under written contracts for which it received $609 million. And the consideration was other than cash, which will be important. So what they're basically talking about here is these sort of private sales to financial institutions. Number two are public sales on regular exchanges, the kinds that you or I might engage in on regular exchanges. Then we've got number three. We'll explain what those are when we get to them. Then we've got these sales by executives, Larson and Garlinghouse. In this case, they refer to them as senior leaders, but we all know who they are. And they say they engaged in unregistered individual XRP sales from which they received at least $450 million and $150 million respectively. You notice in a lot of these SEC securities enforcement cases, a common thread is that somebody made too much money. So obviously, that's a very subjective thing to say because a lot of people in you know who've been following this case and have been fans of XRP, members of the XRP army, would argue that they earned every single cent. But let's face it, when... Together, you made over half a billion dollars. You're just two people. It's going to raise some eyebrows. And that's probably making that amount of money is probably part of why. I mean, I'll say in my opinion, this was possibly a factor in why this enforcement action was brought in the first place. When you make over half a billion dollars and you're only two people, it's going to raise some eyebrows. So let's start out with the institutional sales. So, and this is a big divide. This is a big divide between regular public sales on the exchanges and these institutional sales. The court first addresses Ripple's institutional sales of XRP to sophisticated individuals and entities pursuant to written contracts. So they're going to go through the first prong of Howie and say, defendants argue that an investment of money is different from merely payment of money. That is, Howie requires not just payment of money, but an intent to invest that money. And just by the way the court is describing their argument, you can tell the court is going to disagree. They say, not so. Defendant's purported distinction is not supported by case law. That pretty much says everything. If you want the details, you can read through the details here. We'll move on to the second prong of Howie. So I just just, just reading through this argument, I, I, easy for the court to dismiss this because the court wants to keep it simple. An investment of money is just an investment of money. It's not an investment of money with this intent factor and all these other things. They're, they're like, did they pay money? Then they paid money. Second prong, common enterprise. We've talked in the past how you have horizontal commonality, vertical commonality, and even subtypes. Here they're going to look at horizontal commonality, which exists where the investor's assets are pooled and the fortunes of each investor are tied to the fortunes of other investors, as well as to the success of the overall enterprise. So they're not going to get into the whole broad and narrow thing. Horizontal commonality is a type of commonality that involves the pooling of assets from multiple investors so that all share in the profits and risks of the enterprise. They say here, the undisputed record shows the existence of horizontal commonality. Ripple pooled the proceeds of its institutional sales into a network of bank accounts under the names of its various subsidiaries. Although Ripple maintained separate bank accounts for each subsidiary, Ripple controlled all of the accounts and used the funds raised from the institutional sales to finance operations. Uh oh, that's prongs one and two. Not looking good so far for Ripple and these institutional sales. Here's maybe a more important general point. Further, each institutional buyer's ability to profit was tied to Ripple's fortunes and the fortunes of other institutional buyers because, and here's the critical part, all institutional buyers received the same fungible XRP. So here the court is giving us some language that's basically saying, and it, it, they, they do include the modifier further. So they're saying in addition, but still they're saying you got a fungible token. Maybe that's a factor in horizontal commonality. They're saying each institutional buyer's ability to profit was tied to Ripple's fortunes and the fortunes of the other buyers just because the token was fungible. This is not so good for people who did like ICOs of fungible tokens because they're saying, hey, the fungibility is a factor in horizontal commonality. This is like bad for anybody who did ICOs. Guess who didn't do an ICO? Cardano, at least not an ICO in the US. 
at least not an ICO with any U.S. buyers at all, as per all of the reports on that Japanese ICO. All of the buyers were Japanese, or there was a small number from other countries in Asia. None of them were U.S. buyers. This is a I've contended for a long time, almost the entire I believe probably the entire course of this channel. I've contended that this is a a critical factor in the regulation of Cardano versus other ecosystems. And when you think about those other ecosystems, largely what you got were ICOs. Here, Ripple, there's a big benefit to Ripple here that we're going to get into because Ripple had th these sort of direct sales to these institutions. And they're going to get a different result on those direct sales than they will on the public sales on exchanges, the secondary market sales. The way, according to the reports I've read, the historical reports, it seems to be the case that the way Cardano got to North America and to Europe, because the ICO only happened in Asia, was through the secondary markets. So what happens in this case in the secondary markets is definitely impactful for Cardano. And we're going to see in a very good way. So third prong, though, we got to deal with these institutional cells first. It's not looking good for these institutional cells for Ripple because they've already not gotten the result they want on prongs one and two. So prong three, again, is a reasonable expectation of profits to be derived from the entrepreneurial or managerial efforts of others. They say the reasonable expectation of profits from the ex efforts of others need not be the sole reason a purchaser buys an investment. An asset may be sold for both consumptive and speculative purposes. So here they're citing the library case. This is problematic again for all of these characters in crypto, all these you know entities and ecosystems that did ICOs on this according to this decision, flawed premise that if there's a consumptive use, then somehow they don't flunk this third prong of Howie because there was this consumptive use. The problem is it's crypto. There's always also going to be a speculative use, almost always. There's also going to be an element of speculation. If it's a crypto asset, there's going to be speculation. So you can't get out of Get out of flunking the Howey test just because you also have some consumptive use, according to this court who's citing the library court. Moreover, the inquiry is an objective one focusing on the promises and offers made to investors. It is not a search for the precise motivation of each individual participant. So what they're saying there is the SEC can't just go through and show that somebody you know, out of the, you know, thousands or tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people who bought this asset, you can't, they can't just go through and show one person who bought it for speculative reasons. It is going to be an objective inquiry focusing on the promises and offers made to the investors, not a search for the precise motivation of each individual participant. This is important. So there they're citing the Telegram case. Based on the totality of circumstances, the court finds that reasonable investors situated in the position of the institutional buyers would have purchased XRP with the expectation that they would derive profits from Ripple's efforts. Of course they did. This is very predictable to me because they're institutional investors. <laughs> what do they do? They invest with an expectation of profits. Very hard to describe their purchasing motives as anything other than buying with an expectation of profits. So this is pretty predictable to me. And the result we get is, therefore, having considered the economic reality and totality of circumstances surrounding the institutional cells, the court concludes that Ripple's institutional cells constituted an unregistered offer and sell of investment contracts in violation of Section 5 of the Securities Act. So the SEC got them on that one. Ripple did not get off scot-free here already. Already, Ripple has lost on this point. Those cells, the institutional investors, according to the district court, are in violation of the Securities Act. Now we have the programmatic cells. Obviously, this is the part that's going to be more important for our ecosystem, for Cardano, because Cardano, as far as I know, didn't have these institutional cells. We don't have the same problem that Ripple had. We didn't do this. We didn't have institutions. We didn't have VCs. We didn't have any of these things come in. And this is part of why Cardano has faced this uphill battle because 
we didn't allow the VCs to get in early on our ecosystem. The ecosystems where they got in early, they pushed them. The VCs and the institutions did everything they could, of course, to push those ecosystems because they wanted to make a big profit on their investment. We didn't have that, which, you know, created an uphill battle for us. However, if this, if this court's holding turns out to be the law of the land, this is a huge deal for Cardano because we didn't do this. And guess who did? Almost everybody else. Almost everybody else in crypto did this. Cardano didn't do it. Why? Partially for this reason. Partially exactly for this reason. Also, Charles and the rest of the gang seem to hate VCs. But <laughs> part, of the, part of the rationale, of course, had to be for this reason. Because they also did their ICO in Japan. They could have raised a lot more money probably someplace like North America or Europe or a combination of both or just globally. They didn't do that for regulatory reasons. Or at least, you know, a big part of the rationale was for regulatory uh, regulatory purposes. I'm going to assume the same thing, the same thing about the lack of institutional involvement. Now on to the important part though, the public cells, which are labeled as programmatic cells here. The court next addresses Ripple's programmatic cells. SEC alleges that in the programmatic cells to public buyers on digital asset exchanges, Ripple understood that people were speculating on XRP as an investment, explicitly targeting speculators. So think about this. What the SEC is alleging, what the SEC is claiming is that it's irrelevant that Ripple understood that people were speculating, right? Because that's pretty easy to prove, right? I mean, it's crypto. Everybody's speculating. Everybody's speculating. But does that matter to the court? The court says, having considered the economic reality of the programmatic cells, the court concludes that the undisputed record does not establish that third Howie prong. Third Howie prong expectation, remember in this case it's combined three and four, expectation of profits based solely on the efforts of others. They say, whereas the institutional buyers reasonably expected that Ripple would use, and this is pretty much the best part of this whole decision, the, maybe the most important part and the best part, whereas the institutional buyers reasonably expected that Ripple would use the capital it received from its sales to improve the XRP ecosystem and thereby increase the price of XRP, programmatic buyers could not reasonably expect the same. Ooh, things just went our way in a big way, guys. Indeed, Ripple's programmatic cells were blind bid-ask transactions. Those are the types of normal exchange transactions we do in crypto. And programmatic buyers, here's the crucial part, could not have known if their payments of money went to Ripple or any other seller of XRP. And we know this is the case because if you go on a normal exchange in crypto, you have no idea who the seller is. You don't know. You just buy it. And they're saying, hey, the court is saying, hey, how could they have been relying solely on the efforts of Ripple for their expectation of profits if they didn't know they were even buying from Ripple? This is a great common sense interpretation by Judge Torres. The court here is exactly right. This is exactly why secondary market sales should not be securities under the Howey test because you don't even know who you're buying from in the secondary market. How can you be relying on, you know, a certain entity's efforts if you don't even know who you're buying from? Since 2017, Ripple's programmatic sales represented less than 1% of the global XRP trading volume. Notice they just say since 2017. So, you know, that's like 2017 until now, presumably. I haven't looked at exactly what time period they're, re they're relying on, but the way they wrote it here, it's like 2017 until now. This is important. Therefore, the vast majority of individuals who purchased XRP from digital asset exchanges did not invest their money in Ripple at all. An institutional buyer knowingly purchased XRP directly from Ripple pursuant to a contract. So if a VC bought in your ecosystem, they probably bought it directly from whatever lab entity or whatever group is behind the asset through a contract. So they know exactly who they're buying from and they could be relying 
you know, uh, solely on the efforts of that entity for their expectation of profits because they actually know who they're buying from. But the economic reality is that a programmatic buyer, we're talking about public buyers there, stood in the same shoes as a secondary market purchaser who did not know to whom or what it was paying its money. This is the most important part of this entire decision to me. And it has a huge impact on Cardano because like I said, Cardano came to the US via the secondary markets. And guess what? I, I sure bought a lot of Cardano during that period, and I had no idea who I was buying it from. Neither did you or anybody else that I know of. Nobody, you buy it on an exchange, you could be buying it from anybody, just like these Ripple buyers were. This is huge for Cardano. Guess who it's not huge for? Almost everybody else in crypto who did an ICO. Because when you do an ICO, you're saying, Hey, I'm so-and-so lab entity. I'm such and such foundation. I'm going to sell you crypto. So the buyers know exactly who they're buying from. This is the way it worked with almost every single ICO. Cardano did do an ICO, but it was smart. It did it in Japan and there were no US buyers. This is huge for Cardano. And I would imagine if you looked at Cardano's volume, I said this was important up here, that Ripple's programmatic sales represented less than 1% of the global trading volume. I'm sure you look at Car the volume uh, done by the uh, Cardano founding entities to whatever extent they each of them did sells like this, the foundation of Mergo and IOHK. And I'm sure it's a small part of the trading volume since that same period of time. Actually, I believe it's late 2017 until now. So same period, pretty much. I'm sure it's also a small percentage of the volume. I, I, I don't know what that volume was, but I'm guessing. I mean, we know how much they each got, so we could figure out the volume. But this is excellent for Cardano. And I know some people have said in the past that they thought this whole secondary market issue was already settled in the library case. And I pointed out at the time that that was not the case. So you can see it right here in this footnote 16 on page 23. They explained exactly why that was not the case. The library case did not take care of the secondary market issue. Not like Judge Torres, our hero, just did. And here's why. So here's here's the way she cites us. Whether a secondary market, and I'm 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 acting like she's the only one. Obviously, she has clerks and all that kind of thing. So it's not really just her. You know, it's her entire team of clerks and her and everybody else. So whether a secondary market sell constitutes an effort or sell of an investment contract would depend on the totality of the circumstances and the economic reality of that specific contract transaction or scheme. It's exactly what she told us in the body of her opinion here. See Marine Bank. Marine Bank is. The, and Telegram are the ones giving us that. Then she says, see also. So it's not her primary citation. It's part of the see also where library shows up. And she's, she points out, she's, she's citing library in a secondary position where library declined to extend its holding to include secondary cells. This is why library didn't already take care of this issue. The library court just said, hey, we're not going to extend our holding. Our decision is not also going to apply to secondary cells. So they didn't actually rule on the secondary cells. They just said, we're not extending our holding to the secondary cells because they didn't need to. Here, Judge Torres would have needed to. And so she actually ruled on the secondary cells. And she gave us this fantastic ruling that is maybe better for Cardano than almost anybody else. Cardano having been so careful in its foundation, in its founding and in its ICO is finally paying off. Thank you, Judge Torres, for seeing the beauty of, of having done things the careful way like Cardano did in its ICO and like Cardano has always done. So this is the right decision. She's not letting cryptos off the hook if they did an ICO, if they did direct sales to buyers and buyers knew who they were buying from. Think about it. That's like every single cryptocurrency. That's probably like every single one you've bought except Cardano. You can come up with exceptions, but vast majority of the large cap cryptos did these kinds of ICOs where you knew exactly who you're buying it from. Her holding doesn't help them. It helps us in Cardano because we did things the right way. Let's move on. The programmatic cells also lacked other factors. Here's where things get a little interesting. Here's where 
I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. For instance, the programmatic cells were not made pursuant to contracts that contain lockup provisions, resale restrictions, indemnification clauses, or statements of purpose. So she's saying, hey, these cells to the public, they're not like a cell to an institution, like a VC or something like that, because in those you have these big contracts and they have things like lockup provisions and you know resale restrictions, indemnifications, all these kind of things. Similarly, Ripple's promotional materials, such as the Ripple Primer and Gateway's brochure, were widely circulated amongst potential investors like the institutional buyers, but there is no evidence that these documents were distributed more broadly to the general public, such as XRP purchasers on digital asset exchanges, nor is there evidence that program programmatic buyers <laughs> understood that statements made by Larson Schwartz, who is another founder, Garlinghouse, and others <clears throat> were representatives representations of Ripple and its efforts. So here, this is where, we, where things get kind of interesting. She's saying... Actually, the fact that the public buyers knew less than the VCs is good for Ripple here. You notice this is contrary to where we go in securities regulation a lot of the time. Because we say things like public policy dictates that we need to have disclosure. Why? Because it educates the public buyers who are less sophisticated. Here she's saying them not being educated is actually helpful for Ripple because they couldn't form that expectation of profits based on the efforts of Ripple because maybe they didn't even know Ripple existed. Lastly, and this is more of that, this is just an extension of the same kind of argument Lastly, the institutional buyers were sophisticated entities, including institutional investors and hedge funds. And this is exactly why they say public policy dictates you have to have disclosure for unsophisticated buyers, because public buyers are going to be less sophisticated than a sophisticated financial institution. They say there is no evidence that a reasonable programmatic buyer who is generally less sophisticated as an investor shared similar understandings and expectations as these institutional buyers. So this is the part of her of the decision where I think if a circuit court came around and they were like, actually, we want to go in the opposite direction policy wise, I can see them crafting language, some in their decision that says, hey, the, the district court. So the circuit court is where it would go on appeals. You understand we've got in the federal court system, we've got district courts, circuit courts, which you appeal to. And then from the circuit court, you would appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. So the circuit court would be above the district court. They could come around and say, actually, we noticed that the district court made this argument that it wasn't a security because you know, part of the reason it isn't a security under prong three of the Howey test is that the buyers were not sophisticated enough to actually form this expectation, but protecting those unsophisticated buyers with disclosure is actually a really important public policy point of securities regulation. So we're going to go in completely the opposite direction. I can imagine a court including that kind of logic in their opinion if they decided as a matter of policy they wanted to go in the opposite direction. And by the way, the this is not the way the the um, the court system would talk about this. This distinction I'm making, this um, this idea I'm presenting about courts sort of wanting to go in a certain policy direction and you know crafting language and an ar and arguments based on precedents to to get there. This is not the way the courts would describe the way they do it. They would say that's absolutely not the way they do it. I'm just a realist and I'm talking about how realistically I believe it actually happens. So they say, so in, in the case of this district court though, regardless of what a circuit court might do on appeal with this, she says, there is no evidence that a reasonable public buyer, programmatic buyer would form these same expectations as an institutional buyer. Therefore, having considered the economic reality and the totality of circumstances, which she already told you was her standard, the court concludes that Ripple's programmatic cells, those are the public cells to normal buyers like you and me of XRP, did not constitute the offer and sale of investment contracts. And the important thing here that I already described is that this doesn't apply to ICOs. If you did an ICO as <clears throat> foundation as a foundation or as a lab entity or something like that. And the buyers knew who they were dealing with. Judge Torres isn't helping you here. She's not addressing that circumstance. In fact, 
That looks a lot like the fact pattern she set up with these institutional buyers. She's not helping you if your ecosystem did an ICO. I know a lot of ecosystems where these kinds of ICOs happened, they're going to be celebrating tomorrow like this means that they're not securities. They're misunderstanding what's going on here. Judge Torres is not saying anything here that's helping them at all. She's not addressing that circumstance. In fact, that circumstance looks like the fact pattern that she says does qualify as a security under the Howey test. Basically, what I'm saying is, to me, this looks great for Cardano, not so great for a lot of our competitors because they did things that look a lot more like these ICOs I'm describing. So then we've got this third category, other distributions. What were these? These were uh, distributions to employees as compensation as and to third parties as part of a Ripple initiative to get people to develop on you know applications for XRP and on the XRP ledger. Judge Torres says, the other distributions do not satisfy Howie's first prong, there be an investment of money. And I would describe this as a little wand waving, right? So she says, um, uh, Howie requires a showing that the investors provided the capital or provided, put up their money or provided cash. In every case that found an investment contract, the purchaser gave up some tangible and definable consideration in return for an interest that had substantially the characteristics of a security. She says, here the record shows that recipients of the other distributions did not pay money or some tangible and definable consideration to Ripple. To the contrary, Ripple paid XRP to these employees and companies. The problem with this is that historically it's been pretty easy for courts to find very minor things to be consideration, to be tangible consideration. In fact, one of the most famous um, cases on this, a very, very old case, is one that says something, I'm going to mess up the wording, but something like a mere peppercorn is enough. A mere peppercorn is enough consideration, right? That's one of the famous, uh, famous cases on this from a long time ago. So the problem is, like these employees, they provided labor. If a mere peppercorn is enough consideration, labor is not enough consideration. Obviously, the peppercorn case has to do with, if I remember correctly, contract formation, slightly different, but still I could see a circuit court coming to a different conclusion on this one. This is a little, little wand waving. She's not even addressing that there was labor there. She's not explaining why the labor is not tangible and definable consideration. I do like this sentence though where she says the record shows that recipients of the other distributions did not pay money to the contrary ripple paid xrp to these employees and companies i like that because it's sort of pointing to crypto as currency being okay payment for services she's saying that's okay i love this and this is why i say things like sometimes judges to some extent they have a public policy destination in mind they want to get there and they get there somehow and sometimes there's a little wand waving going on a little bit like this to me i love it don't get me wrong i love it i love judge torres for doing it but a, a circuit court could go the other direction on this one in my mind at least um again though this um would not affect uh something like you know cardano secondary cells you know this is about employees of an entity getting crypto whether or not that was a an investment contract that might qualify as a security and she's already said that just because something like this might be an investment contract qualifies as a security it doesn't mean the underlying asset would be a security so for cardano this is also not problematic She's therefore having considered the economic reality and totality of circumstances the court concludes that ripples other distributions did not constitute the offer and sell of investment securities then she gets into chris larson and brad garlinghouse's offers and sells and we don't have to go into a lot of detail here but she points out these were programmatic sales on digital exchanges through blind bid ass transactions larson and garlinghouse did not know to whom they sold xrp and the buyers did not know the identity of the seller this is a matter of law the record cannot establish the third Howie Prong as to these transactions, just like in the case of Ripple's programmatic or public transactions. Then we've got, so now she has to, to deal with Ripple's due process defenses, because remember, she found that Ripple did violate the Securities Act in terms of those institutional cells. 
And we won't go to a lot of detail here, but she says the court rejects defendants' fair notices and vagueness defenses. They were saying, hey, we didn't have fair notice, and the law is vague and ambiguous. We don't have any regulatory clarity. She rejects those arguments as to the institutional cells. If you want to know why, you can go through and read the explanation, the court's, uh, the court's opinion here, which explains exactly why they're coming to that conclusion. But the upshot here before we get to one last little bit, is accordingly the SEC's motion for summary judgment is granted as to the institutional cells. So SEC won a summary judgment on the institutional cells. Otherwise, they lost. And Ripple, so the defendants were really Ripple, I think Garlinghouse and Larson, if I remember correctly. Ripple and the other defendants' motion for summary judgment is granted as to the programmatic cells the other cells and Larson's and Garlinghouse cells and denied as the institutional cells. So basically SEC wins on institutional cells, Ripple wins on everything else. Again, great for Cardano, not so great for these ecosystems that did ICOs. They don't have any additional regulatory clarity here really on their ICOs. Fantastic for us because we didn't do an ICO. So they'll all be celebrating like us tomorrow, but just know we have a little more reason to be celebrating than they do. Not a little, a lot. Then we have Larson and Garlinghouse's aiding and abetting of Ripple's violations, which is going to turn out to be why this case is not over. So basically, we have this we have this thing on a on a an allegation like this. You've basically got to have some kind of scienter. So they say the SEC must show that there was a securities law violation. And that Larson and Garlinghouse had some kind of knowledge of this violation as the aiders and abettors, and that they provided substantial assistance, that they aided and abetted. But you've got the scienter requirement, which means they have to have some kind of knowledge. They, they couldn't have just like accidentally done this. They couldn't have done it without knowing it. The SEC must show that Larson and Garlinghouse knew or recklessly disregarded the facts that made Ripple's transactions and schemes illegal under statutory and and applicable case law. So they had to have known that those transactions were illegal, or they had to have recklessly disregarded facts that, you know, basically would have made them know that it was illegal. The court says, based on the record, defendants have raised a genuine dispute of material fact as to whether Gar Larson and Garlinghouse knew or recklessly disregarded the facts that made Ripple's scheme illegal. So because there's a genuine dispute of material fact, remember we said the way summary judgments work is you only get a summary judgment if that judgment can be made on the facts that everybody agrees about. Now there's a genuine dispute of material fact, of actually relevant fact, um, as to whether or not they knew or recklessly disregarded the facts. So what does that mean? That means it has to go to trial because we have a question of fact. It has to go to a trial so that a finding of fact can be made. Defendants have raised a genuine issue as to whether Larson and Garlinghouse knew or recklessly disregarded facts. For example, defendants have abduced evidence that Larson and Garlinghouse did not know that Ripple's institutional cells of XRP satisfied the Howey common enterprise element because they did not believe that the proceeds from the cells were pooled and understood that Ripple did not manage, operate, or control the XRP ledger or the broader XRP ecosystem. Obviously, in trial, a jury is going to decide if that's true or not. Based on the disputed facts in the record, therefore, a reasonable juror could find that Larson and Garlinghouse did not know or recklessly disregarded Ripple's Section 5 violations. So they're saying we need to have a fact finder in here. We can't just rule on this on law. We need to have a fact finder in here to decide this issue because they're claiming this. The SEC is claiming something else, So and it comes out of the facts, so we need to have a fact finder. So that part's got to go to trial. Accordingly, the SEC's motion for summary judgment on the aiding and abetting claim against Larson and Garlinghouse is denied. For the foregoing reasons, the SEC's motion for summary judgment is granted as to the institutional cells and otherwise denied. Defendant's motion for summary judgment is granted as to the programmatic cells, the other distributions, and Larson's and Garlinghouse's cells and denied as to the institutional cells. The court shall issue a separate order setting a trial date and related pretrial deadlines is due course in due course. So there's going to be a trial or a settlement. It could be settled now. This, this case could actually be settled. Maybe Garlinghouse and Larson just want to settle this and move on with their lives. They got what they wanted for Ripple. 
um, mostly, you know, not in the institutional cells, but they got a pretty good result. I think they're definitely going to be popping bottles tonight and probably making plans about how they settle the rest of it. Who knows though? I mean, they have the choice. They could decide not to settle, but maybe the more important part for the rest of us in crypto is what about that whole thing? The whole thing with a possible appeal to the circuit court by the SEC. There will be plenty of time to talk all about the appeal or possible appeal and look at what might happen there and what actually does happen there. But for now, my take is kind of in line with what you see here. So this poster said there will be appeals, but there will also be a pivot from the Democrats and the SEC to we need new laws, which I think is the right outcome. People still should have access to information and disclosures, and there are plenty of sensible ideas for ideas for logical regimes. This is the right outcome. And this is correct because a while ago, we remember even Gary Gensler saying he needed new laws in order to regulate crypto. And then he moved to, I have all the laws I need. I'm going to regulate. I'm going to legislate by regulation, basically, which is what he's not supposed to do, which is exactly what he's done. Now, hopefully we will see this, that they move back to, we need new laws so that the lawmakers can actually make the laws instead of the bureaucrats like Gary Gensler. This is what we've needed. This is what we've been demanding all along. Let the lawmakers make the laws. Let the judges interpret the laws, but let the lawmakers make the laws. None of that should involve bureaucrats. This, this reaction is also right. He says, this is precisely right. The Second Circuit could even reverse the district court on every win Ripple got. So the Second Cir Circuit come along and say, Ripple should not have gotten those summary judgments. And then this would happen. So that won't happen for months and months, and would, but it would precipitate a fresh chapter in the district court that would take months and months. So even if the the circuit court reversed Judge Torres's rulings in favor of crypto, basically on things like these secondary market sales, then it would just go back down. The district, the circuit court would be saying, "Hey, district court, uh, you were wrong on those summary judgment issues," which means you shouldn't have granted the summary judgment. But that doesn't mean that you still couldn't rule in favor of crypto once you've had a full trial and fact finding. And so then we'd start this whole brand new thing in district court that would take forever again. But here's the upshot. Like this original poster said, the policy debate completely changes today. No more of Gary Gensler saying Congress doesn't need to do anything. I'll just take care of everything myself. I'm Gary Gensler. That argument is done. It was wrong yesterday, but today you are a fool if you try to say it. And all of crypto is agreeing with him. Thank goodness. Judge Torres really was a hero here. I think the policy outcome is correct. It's hard to make the case that ICOs, I should, I'll, I'll put it this way. It's a very different case to say that ICOs somehow comply with US securities laws. That's a very different case to make. But the secondary market case, I think Judge Torres came to exactly the right decision on that. Because you look at an ecosystem like Cardano, who did everything right. They did an ICO in Japan according to Japanese law. They did it, they did something in Japan that was totally legal in Japan. I'm not an expert on Japanese law at all, of course, but every report I've seen has indicated that everything was done exactly according to Japanese law in Japan. And that's how it should be. Should assets that are totally legal under Japanese law, should they be should they be allowed to come into the US through secondary markets? That's a totally different question. And the answer, of course, has generally been yes, we have all kinds of assets that come into US markets, both primary and secondary from Japan. And Cardano is one of those assets that's done that. And according to Judge Torres, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong with that. Judge Torres is a hero. This is only one chapter in what could be a much longer battle, regulatory battle for basically the very existence of crypto. But Judge Torres was a hero for crypto today. And for that, I'll probably 
always be thankful to her. I'll probably always be grateful to Judge Torres for what she did today. This was an important step. This could be a complete change in momentum for our whole our whole crypto broader ecosystem. We basically went from being being outlaws in almost every way, according to Gary Gensler and his SEC and the current administration, to a single judge coming along and saying, hey, everybody understands that the current administration hates crypto for some reason, but it's not up to the executive branch to interpret law. That's actually the judicial branch's, branch's job. And she stepped up and made the right decision. I'll always be grateful. I hope everybody else is as happy about this as I am. And I'll talk to you soon.